This is uh, lecture outline eight, Roman numeral three. Uh, in the first two Roman numerals, we talked about the uh, wave-like and particle-like properties of uh, light or electromagnetic radiation. Uh, today, we're going to talk about, or in this video, we're going to talk about atomic spectra and the Bohr atom. And uh, we're really going to start talking about the wave-like and particle-like properties of an electron. And really, we're going to focus on the wave-like properties of an electron because the particle-like property that it has mass, that mass can have a position as well, uh, that is pretty well known. The wave-like properties are the more uh, hard to get at piece, and we're going to talk a lot about them. But along the way, we're going to talk, uh, figure out where the electrons are in atoms. And so let's talk about atomic spectra and the Bohr atom. And where we're going to start is that sunlight uh, is white light, and uh, we're going to work our way towards the Bohr atom. So uh, white light, it contains a continuous spectrum of all visible colors, some infrared and some uh, ultraviolet. And there's a nice picture of it in color. And you can see uh, one thing to note is that the red here is at the top. The uh, violet is down here at the bottom, so ultraviolet, which we can't see, would be down here as well. And so a couple notes we want to make about this. Um, so uh, up here is the red. Down here is the violet. Uh, and the prism separates those colors. Uh, so that's uh, white light coming in. The prism separates it, refracts it uh, into its colors. And, as a side note, violet light is refracted more. Now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at the results of flame tests for aqueous metal ions. And the thing that we have to know about this is first off, these are uh, metal ions. They're put into a flame uh, and that each of these metal ions have different colors when they're put into a flame. And so yellow for sodium, purple, red, and barium is sort of a whitish yellow. So uh, first off we have so uh, sodium, potassium, lithium, we have red, oh sorry, yellow, purple, red, and sort of whitish yellow. And uh, let's talk a little bit about this process here. So the aqueous ions, when they're put into a flame, these metals, these metal ions, if you will, so the flame adds a large amount of energy to the metals. which makes the metals emit light. And uh, true, that is a simplification of the process. If you have questions, we can talk about uh, the process in more detail in office hours or uh, any of the times that you'll be seeing me online. But that's a simple process. Give atoms energy. One way to do it is a flame. Those uh, atoms then emit light. And this is for metals. If we do the same thing for gases, uh, you will, uh, we observe a similar phenomenon. So uh, they emit light as well. Now, uh, just to tell you this is a gas discharge tube, uh, we would get to work with these in lab uh, if we had lab, if we had this lab. But let me sketch this process for you. Uh, this gas discharge tube is in a setup. And this is showing some sort of battery or power supply. It's a power supply. It does plug in. And um, when you do this, uh, you're applying approximately 5,000 volts and approximately 0 0.1 amps. And basically, you are 
adding a large amount of energy to the atoms. These atoms happen to be hydrogen atoms. So my note over here is add a large amount of energy to gas atoms which makes the atoms emit light. So now we've got it for metals, now we've got it for gases, uh, although uh, mercury is a gas metal as well. So, uh, And these are just the two easiest experiments to do. Uh, other experiments can show that this is a general phenomenon for all elements. Um, here we have hydrogen in bonds, and yet we are going to focus on the fact that the hydrogen atoms in those bonds are the ones emitting light through these processes. But it is a general phenomenon. Now we're going to focus specifically on hydrogen, and when we do that, we're going to take a gas discharge tube and give it energy, then that uh, gas discharge tube, the hydrogen will emit light. We will pass it through a slit to get a thin beam. We will pass it through a, uh, so slit creates thin beam. Then the prism uh, refracts each color differently. Uh, and that's because of each color's different wavelength and how it interacts with the prism. Happy to say more about that in office hours too, but that's enough for now, I think. Uh, reacts, uh, refracts each color differently, thereby separating the colors onto some sort of screen or photographic film. And what we can see here, and again, we'll go to the actual color version. Uh, we can see that there are one, two, three, four, only four colors that are being emitted by the hydrogen atom, hydrogen atoms. So one, two, three, only four colors being emitted by the hydrogen atoms. And that gets a couple of exclamation points because at the time, the scientists were stunned. They did this experiment with the full expectation that they were going to get a full rainbow of colors over here. Uh, and this is, of course, pre-quantum mechanics. This is part of the cause of why quantum mechanics was developed or uh, one of the initial pieces of data. One of the pieces of data. Uh, I don't know if it was initial or not. I think it was. Anyway, so now hydrogen has four colors and only four colors. These are the only four colors in the visible region, at least. And this is a nice, simple experiment to show how those colors are separated. Well, if you do it for other gases, again, using gas discharge tubes, we could also do this for metals as well. You would see that we get different colors. So uh, we get different colors yet none of them has a total spe uh, spectrum of all the colors. So analyzing other gases, each gas emits a specific set of wavelengths. And uh, one thing you'll note, and this is a general trend, although it's not um, the direct correlation, I will point out that as you get larger and larger atoms, really we're talking about the hydrogen atom here and the oxygen atom, you do get more wavelengths too. Good. All right, now we do this experiment in the opposite way. Instead of emitting light, we uh, put light into the atoms. We use a diffraction grating. And again, we'll briefly show the color picture here. Uh, take a light source, 
uh, with all the colors. You go ahead and uh, use the diffraction grating this time instead of a prism, still separates the colors, an aperture to make a thin slit. Uh, so you can select one of the colors through a sample to a detector. So we start with uh, all wavelengths. We use the diffraction grating to separate colors. We use an aperture to select a, uh, get a thin beam, which selects a narrow range of wavelengths. Put it through the sample, the sample for hydrogen which would be tough to do in an aqueous sample, but let's imagine. Sample for hydrogen would only absorb those same four colors. Still amazed by that fact. Been doing this for 20 years. Still so cool. And it's a simple experiment. Now these are the absorption and emission spectra for hydrogen. This really does look much better in color. You can very clearly see, well, uh, one, two, three, four colors being uh, the top one is the absorption spectrum. So those are the only colors missing. The bottom one is the emission spectrum. Those are the only four colors present. So there's something very special about those four wavelengths in the visible region for hydrogen. Okay, and that's what led, among other things, to the Bohr model of the atom. The Bohr model of the atom got ma ma many things uh, correct and in the right direction. Those are the only parts I'm going to be presenting. You do not have to know Bohr's name you do have to know the parts of his model that are correct, and that's what I'm presenting here. So uh, Bohr's major idea was that the energy states of the atom were quantized. Hence the name quantum mechanics. Um, and that the amount of energy in the atom was related to the electron's position in the atom. And so a few words about quantized and what it means. Uh, quantized means that, in this case for the energy, that the uh, energy uh, of the atom can only have uh, specific values. Not any value. And as a uh, bit of an analogy, not a perfect one, but hopefully this makes the point. If you think about going up and down a set of stairs, your height can more or less only have specific values as your foot or feet land on each step. It's very difficult for, uh, say, for your feet or your body, uh, your feet to have an in-between level. And the difference being, and why this is not a perfect analogy, is that for the electron, for the atom, uh, there it's impossible for it to have these in-between heights or these in-between energy values. Okay. Now, um, other part of this, uh, of the Bohr model, the electrons travel in orbits that are at a fixed distance from the nucleus, uh, and orbits that are farther away from the nucleus have higher energies.
And this takes us back to something we've talked about before. If we think specifically about the hydrogen atom, then the hydrogen atom has one proton, one electron. We can think of this as a positive and a negative charge. And uh, we've talked before about which uh, would be a higher energy state, a positive and a negative charge with uh, this distance, or a positive and a negative charge with a larger distance. And we decided that's similar to an analogy where a pen, if it is higher, has higher potential energy as it falls, or higher potential energy as it could fall, that an elect uh, a negative and a positive farther apart has a higher energy. And so that's a, a pretty good analogy, I think, for why an electron farther away from the nucleus would have a higher energy. Okay. Um, three, electrons emit radiation when they jump from an orbit with higher energy down to an orbit with lower energy. Uh, so this emission of light is going to be due to the transition of the electron from a farther uh, a position farther away from the nucleus to a position closer to the nucleus. And so those, that emitted light is telling us about the transitions of the atom and really about the transitions of the electron or an electron in an atom as it moves from a higher to a lower energy level. When that light is absorbed, it is an electron moving from a lower to a higher energy level. So, uh, right, that's what we're gonna see. And that's the Bohr model the atom is going to lead us to being able to calculate uh, and understand that these light, these wavelengths of light and the energy stored in them are moving electrons either farther away from the nucleus when that uh, energy is absorbed or the electrons moving closer to the nucleus when that wavelength is emitted. And so here we get to uh, a picture of the Bohr model of the atom and uh, looks, uh, so here's the nucleus in the center, drawn much bigger than it actually is. And we have n equals one, two, three, four, and five. I should say uh, that there are more values of n that these are all that fit on this slide. And um, that uh, it has been shown that, and we will be able to show, that the energies of the four colors, three of which are shown here, correspond to an electron jumping, well, for 657 nanometers. That's going to be the lowest energy, longest wavelength, Co corresponds to an electron jumping from n equals 3 to n equals 2, as we will see. Bigger jumps will be higher energy and shorter wavelength. And then there's another one over here, at 411 nanometers, and that one is from n equals six. So electron to n equals two. Now, each of these jumps, if we go from three to one, or any of these down to one, will be larger energy than the visible region It'll be in the uh, ultraviolet area. So there are other jumps. These are just the ones we can see in the visible region. Okay, now um, for the hydrogen atom, the Rydberg equation relates wavelength to the n values that I just showed you for the Bohr atom. The Rydberg equation looks like this, one over wavelength of the light being absorbed. equals 1.097 times 10 to the seventh meters to the minus one. One over n f squared minus one over n i squared. And a couple things about this. Uh, first off, uh, when Rydberg historically developed this, it was n equals two and n equals one here. So I am altering this equation a little bit to make it more in line with my class 
where the final and the initial state, we always go from final to initial or final minus initial. So this part is specific to my class and to keep it more in line with the material in my class. And I also add a minus sign here. That minus sign is gonna be in line with what we talked about energy. When an atom emits light, then it is going to emit a wavelength and we will get a negative wavelength here, which is a little weird. What it means is that wavelength is emitted. Again, this is also specific to my class, but I think hopefully you'll find it keeps everything more similar to the rest of my class, if that's even a word or a phrase. So for my class. So you'll see slightly different versions of the Rydberg equation uh, when you do it um, in other classes, say. And so the negative sign on wavelength can mean that the light is being emitted. And then the question is, what is the wavelength of light emitted as electron, an electron jumps from n equals four to n equals one? Now, from four to one means it is getting closer to the nucleus. It is going from four to one. So that means light will be emitted and we will get, uh, but what it means is that one is our final state. Four is our initial state. Getting our calculator out here. There we go. So we'll do this first part first. I'll show you how I type it into my calculator. So uh, it's gonna be one squared, hit the squared button, and then I have to shift to get one over. Still one, I know. Minus uh, four squared, one over. So I get this portion is 0 0.9375. Multiply that times the uh, term here. I get this large number here. And uh, I'm gonna put in scientific notation, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one point oh three times 10 to, to 10 to the plus seventh meters to the minus one. Uh, then I'm going to uh, take the reciprocal of this number in order to get wavelength Go back to 1.03 times 10 to the seven, then shift one over. I get that my wavelength is 9.71 times 10 to the minus eight. Now my meters is now, meters to the minus one is now meters. And since uh, 10 to the minus nine would be nanometers, This is equal to 97.1 nanometers. That is uh, not in the visible region, that is in the ultraviolet region, as we expected from the previous one. So we expected that shift to be higher energy than the ones in the visible region on the previous page, and it is. Okay. This is going to be a companion problem. Oh, sorry, I have to derive another equation for you first. It says, from wavelength in the Rydberg equation, the energy of an electron in a hydrogen atom can be calculated. So, in a previous lecture outline, we derived an equation, or we put together an equation, where energy equals Planck's constant times the speed of light over wavelength. We now have the Rydberg equation which is in terms of one over wavelength. So we will now be able to say, instead of wavelength in the denominator, let's plug in here. We still keep our H times C. So we get a new equation this uh, 
number this constant times the speed of light which is constant times the Planck's constant gives us if we multiply all those three numbers out we get minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 our units which we will not show but believe me it works out will be joules leave a little space here because we're about to put something in in a minute Remember, so far we're doing this only for hydrogen, but we want to generalize it. 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. Okay, so this is the equation for hydrogen. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and make it general. That is a z, and it is squared, and so... Uh, this with the z equation it's one of my favorite equations actually and yes that's a hint um, is uh, able to calculate the energy for the transition of an electron from n one a final n value uh, to a from an initial to a final n value for any one electron system Now, let me tell you what Z is. Z is the atomic number, which is the number of protons. And for hydrogen, Z equals one, and one squared dropped out. And so uh, when we go to other elements though, so let's go to helium. Z equals two, and the one electron system, since a helium atom has two electrons, this equation works for the helium plus one ion. We can also, Z equals three for lithium. Lithium two plus has one electron. So hopefully you're starting to get the idea that for any one electron system, and that one electron system, by the way, is something that has just a nucleus and one electron, relatively simple to calculate the charge between these. Anything else with two or more electrons gets much more complicated. And now that we're doing it for one electron system, so the nucleus could be plus one, the nucleus could be plus two, nucleus could be plus three, but it's still calculating the energy between two things and that we can do. And I'm happy to explain more about that in office hours as to why that is, um, that it's only two particles, but for now, it works very nicely. Calculate the energy difference uh, between N equals one and N equals two energy levels for a helium ion. Let's go ahead and do it. We have our first part of the equation, helium plus, that is a one electron system, so we can use this equation. However, Z is gonna be two, and we end up with Z squared or two squared. So between one and two energy levels for a helium ion. So we're going to assume that uh, N, let's see, yeah, let's go from Ni equals one, and uh, final equals two. So two squared minus one over one squared. Uh, plugging this in, let's start with this portion over here first. So two squared inverse minus one squared inverse. I get minus 0 0.75 times two squared times 2.18 negative uh, exponent 18 minus. See if that worked out. Yes, it is positive because my two negative signs cancel out. I get 6.54 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. 
uh, as the amount of energy between that, those two energy levels for a helium plus ion. Now, um, this equation, one of my favorites, by the way, hint, hint, is uh, calculating the energy for shifting an electron from one energy level to another. Um, so we're going to use, even though this equation only gives units of joules, it is for the movement of one electron. So per one electron moved, we will add the units of joules per electron here uh, for, uh, and you'll see this in future examples. Now, this is also true that uh, we can calculate and have calculated the energy of a photon of light uh, based on this energy. And when we do that, we will add the units per photon. And so this energy, sorry, this energy is associated with a specific thing happening. It is for the movement of an electron in a helium atom, here's the nucleus, going from n equals one to n equals two. And that process, since it's a positive energy, will absorb a photon with a specific wavelength. So uh, this equation can give you any set of the three units since it's associated with this process. Now, uh, this one's gonna be a companion problem. It's a very similar problem except from two to three, and we'll do n equals, uh, ni equals two, and nf equals three. I will leave it for you to solve. Great practice, by the way. However, I will tell you uh, at least one thing about it, and that is as you go from two to three, the energy difference will be smaller, or the energy change, or the energy will be smaller than for ni equals one to n final equals two. And that's because as you go from the nucleus outwards, the energy levels are getting closer and closer together as you move away from the nucleus. And that's represented from that equation where energy levels are in the denominator and in fact the squared is in the denominator. So just something, a nice trend to point out.